Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Educators all over the world are rapidly transitioning to learning online, some for the very first time. AWS and Amazon put together a webinar series for educators by educators who have expertise in online learning. Today, we have Dr. Lodge McCammon, who is an instructional designer, keynote speaker, and author. He's going to talk about online instructional strategies that just plain work. Before we get started, know that you are all muted, but we want to hear from you. Please use the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel to communicate with us. We'd love to hear from you, where you're from, and also to answer some of the questions throughout the presentation here today. We will answer your questions as we go along and also have time at the end. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Lodge McCammon. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Amazon and AWS Educate for including me in this series. My name is Lodge McCammon, and I'm currently at home, uh, like most of you. And I'm doing my best to use strategies that can create meaningful and impactful online experiences for my learners. And today, you are my learners. And this is one method that I use. A simple video camera in my living room allows me to present this information. And I've used a similar setup to create thousands of videos to document songs, lessons, speeches, stand-up comedy bits, and even dance routines. In addition to all that, I'm also an instructional designer at Wake Tech Community College, which is a large community college in Wake County, North Carolina. I work on a team that among other things, is doing our best to make sure that the online courses we offer our diverse student population are just as good or better than the seated courses, which is more important than ever, given that all our seated courses have been moved online because of the pandemic. I imagine that many of you are in a similar situation. So I'd like to share some of what we are working on, which hopefully will help. You know, when making recommendations to a variety of instructors about improving online learning environments, we generally want to suggest best practices that are content agnostic, meaning that they can be used to drive student success in any online course. So today we are going to discuss best practices that fit into three categories. Executive functioning, where we are helping students with things like organization and planning. Instructor presence, we want to make sure that students see their online instructor as a real person. And active learning. We want to make sure that students are challenged to create and share their ideas. One way my colleague Lauren Caruso and I are experimenting with promoting best practices across campus is by creating and sharing what I call micro documentaries. Think of these as two minute professional development experiences on demand. Each video features a Wake Tech instructor talking about why they use an instructional strategy, followed by a quick walkthrough of their process, and ends with Wake Tech students talking about how the practice works for them. I would like to share a few of these documentaries with you today and also use them to help model an active learning experience. We will watch one of the videos, then I will pause and give you time to share your ideas on how you might be able to use the strategy to enhance your online classes. So let's jump in and try one. Our first story is about how to help our online students with their executive functioning. John Etheridge and Patrick Williams are faculty members in the English department at Wake Tech Community College. They decided to do a joint benchmark to address some common issues that students struggle with in English 111, such as time management and being prepared for the online learning environment. We know that English 111 is a difficult course for freshmen, and they struggle with organizational skills as much as they do with the course material. Students need these foundational skills to manage not just our course, but all the courses they're taking. So we decided to create an interactive orientation, basically a slow on ramp that assists students in building these executive functions. So they are able to see and develop a clear path to success. To do this, Patrick and John worked together to write and design an introductory learning module composed of orientation materials, a student self-evaluation, and an action plan for students to complete, which has them map out all of their assignments and due dates for the semester. Though this lesson module only requires two to three hours for students to complete, the results so far have been very encouraging. 93% of students who have completed the action plan and intro module go on to complete the course. 
The student feedback was also promising. The course orientation was very helpful because I had never taken an English course online before and I did not know what to expect. The action plan assignment was a good tool and a nice way to remind myself of what I thought was a good idea before I found myself stressed or flustered. I was able to meet all of the goals of my action plan, which were to really take my time with assignments, manage and use my time wisely in order to avoid procrastinating, and most importantly, turning in my assignments on time. Helping students improve their executive functioning is so important, especially in online classes. Now, in addition to what John and Patrick talked about, some instructors are also creating weekly calendars for students to remind them of what they should be working on each day of the week and how long each task may take. This can help keep them on track and motivated. So now I would like to hear from you. I'm going to give you three minutes to do the following. First, think and write. I would like you to answer the question, how can I use this in my course? Second, share your ideas with the class using the chat feature or share on Twitter using the hashtag AWSEducate. And three, review and discuss the ideas of your peers. You know, sometimes the idea of making a video is really intimidating. I've got to get my hair ready. I've got to put on a nice shirt. I've got to find a nice background for my shot. I've got to assemble all my visuals. But what if I just want to get some quick information out to my students? The next story is about how two instructors work together to help students with their executive functioning while also improving their instructor presence. Kelly Kelts and Lisa Martin work in the English department at Wake Tech Community College. When teaching English 111, they are always looking for ways to improve instructor presence in their online classes. So let's take a look at what they're working on this semester. Embedding instructor voice throughout online modules can be very powerful, especially in gateway courses like English 111. We want to make sure that students know that we, the instructors, are humans and not just faceless graders marking up their work. So we decided to create podcasts. How cool is that? It's extremely cool. Each week, Kelts and Martin create a short podcast, which is an informal audio recording where they share some content and provide helpful tips. To do this, first they write out a transcript of all the information they want students to have for the week. Then they simply record themselves reading the transcript into their phones using a free podcasting app called Anchor. Just hit the plus button, then record, and talk. Kelts and Martin then take a few minutes to edit their recordings, cutting out unnecessary pauses and deleting mistakes. Finally, they embed the Anchor podcast right into a Blackboard module so students like Amy and Elizabeth can just click play and receive helpful information from their instructor. I'd just like to start off by saying I love the weekly podcast. It really gives the students a feeling that we actually have a teacher, and if I have a problem, it's actually a person I'm reaching out to, and that makes me way more prone to reach out via email when I do need help. 
I appreciate the advice given in the weekly overview. Sometimes the workload for English 111 needs to be properly time managed. And hearing from my instructors what assignments should be prioritized first is extremely helpful. There are a number of tools out there that can be used to create this type of informal audio content, including Anchor, which is what Kelts and Martin were talking about, or Audacity, which is what I'm using here. Uh, but now it's your turn to share. Take three minutes and let's keep the ideas flowing. Think and write, how can I use this in my course? Share your ideas with the class and review and discuss the ideas of your peers. I've got all these PowerPoint presentations and other materials on my computer that I reference during my live lessons. Uh, there are visuals that I need to show my students to enhance their understanding of the content. So when this is the case, I can use a screen recording software. Right now I'm using Screencast-O-Matic. I just sit in front of my computer with the webcam on so my students can see me, or off if I just want them to hear my voice, and I record my lessons. They don't have to be fancy or perfect or even scripted to be effective. And according to research, a pre-recorded lesson video like this can be 60 to 80 percent shorter than a live lecture that covers the same information. This is a great and efficient way to deliver the content and also a powerful way to demonstrate instructor presence. But don't take my word for it. Megan McIntyre is an instructor in the Mathematics and Physics Department at Wake Tech Community College. She teaches statistical methods and is always looking for ways to improve the learning experience for her online students. So let's take a look at what she's creating this semester. I want my students to feel like they have a real engaged teacher in their online classes. So I make a video for each lesson that I teach throughout the course. Seeing and hearing me consistently can increase student success and it helps me make meaningful connections. Megan uses a tool called Flashback Recorder to create her videos, many of which are voiceover narration while she works through problems in, this in Excel. This simple recording software allows Megan to quickly capture her lessons and upload them to YouTube so she can share them with her students by embedding links in Blackboard. One of her videos on exponential functions has over 70,000 views. So not only are her Wake Tech students learning from her expertise, but a wide variety of students are benefiting from her work, making Megan a bit YouTube famous. Because these video lessons have proven to be better than the explanations provided in the textbook, the department is working to replace the text with videos and Desmos lessons. So what do the students think about Megan's lesson videos? Well. I wasn't sure how an online math class would work because in-class instruction is such a big portion of learning the material, but the videos made it feel like I was getting personal instruction. My favorite part of the class were the videos. They were informative and helped me understand what we were supposed to be tackling each week. 
Your YouTube videos were also a plus because you were showing us the way that you wanted us to learn and it made more sense. Recording lesson videos ahead of time allows us to avoid live lecturing over the internet, which can be a little chaotic. There can be a variety of tech problems like video and audio cutting out, making it difficult for students to see or hear portions of the presentation. Instead, we can send the students our lesson videos to watch and then bring them together to do things like discuss and collaborate. Speaking of that, I want to hear from you. Take three minutes, think, write, share, and review. There are a number of reasons why I might want to meet with my students in a live, synchronous online learning environment, and this session actually demonstrates one of them when I want students to come together to share and discuss ideas in real time, like you have been doing. I also might want to have live Q&A sessions or even have office hours where students can connect to talk to their instructor. Now, we have the technology to connect with students basically anywhere using something as simple and informal as our cell phone. Now, this is also a great way to demonstrate that instructor presence. Tracy Rowe is an instructor in the Communications and Theater Department at Wake Tech Community College. She teaches interpersonal communication and is always looking for new ways of enhancing the learning experience for her online students. So let's find out what she's up to this semester. I don't want my students feeling isolated in their online classes. So I use synchronous and asynchronous video strategies to create a strong instructor presence. When my students see me as a real approachable person, I find that they share more and produce higher quality work. In addition to using announcement videos that include quick content recaps and helpful tips, Tracy also offers students synchronous video class meetings using Adobe Connect. This allows her to develop those deeper connections with students. For example, at the beginning of the semester, instead of giving a syllabus quiz, Tracy has the students read through the syllabus and find something that they want to know that is not included in the document. Then she offers a synchronous class meeting so students can ask their questions live. And what is the most common thing students want to know? Well, they want to know more about their instructor, of course. They typically ask questions like, what was your path to success? And can you tell us more about yourself? So, Tracy asked students what they thought about her using all these video strategies. And here's what they said. The fact that Professor Rowe takes the time and care to create videos made me more willing to work hard, which made this course more fun and enjoyable. I was able to ask more questions and she was able to um, go more into depth and it honestly helped me succeed. It really helped us understand and also just gave a, a face to an instructor uh, for a class in which uh, ordinarily we would not have a face to look at. Uh, so it felt more like a seated class. As Tracy discussed, asynchronous videos, even as informal as what I'm creating here, I've just got my cell phone and I'm recording myself while taking a walk, 
when my neighbors are playing basketball, the birds are chirping and the wind is blowing. Uh, even this can be an effective and engaging way of communicating updates and content. Now, the more students see you as a real person, the more they may engage in your course. So now I want to hear what you have to say. Take three minutes, you know the drill. We shared high impact strategies that can help students with their executive functioning, as well as strategies that can help improve instructor presence. I also modeled an active online learning environment by delivering a few minutes of content, pausing, challenging you to create, share, and discuss, and then I repeated that sequence, making sure to use small chunks of content and task switching to engage my class. But I have one more active learning strategy that I would like to model. Now, of course, all these media creation tools and techniques are not just for instructors to use. They can also be used by students to create a dynamic online learning environment. We know from research that one of the most powerful assignments is to challenge the students to teach the content and have them record and share their lessons. For some inspiration, here is my five-year-old niece teaching about the number line, a lesson that she will never forget. My name is Elizabeth and I'm going to teach you guys how to use a number line and what adding and subtracting is. So a number line is a line, this line, a line that has numbers on it. Of course, I want to model this, so I have a challenge for you. Grab your cell phone or use your computer and record a 20 second or less video in any style that summarizes what you learned during this presentation. Tweet out your video and include the hashtag AWSEducate. At the end of the Q&A session, we will select some of those great 20 second lesson videos and those who tweeted them will get an Alexa device or an Amazon gift card. If you want your students to remember something, Simply point a camera in their direction and challenge them to teach. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy, and I look forward to watching your lessons. Yeah, and thank you so much, Lodge. That was that was fantastic. I uh, really appreciate you know all the things you're sharing. I saw lots of great comments that were coming in and questions. Certainly, we we certainly encourage everyone continue to ask your questions in the question pane. We'll get to them as fast as we can. I know quite a number came in. A few of them came in. Uh, Lodge, I think around what was that last challenge? I don't know if you want to just repeat it really quick. I think some people just missed it and maybe missed the hashtag. We'll put that into the chat window as well. Um, I know some people just quickly ask questions about what was that last challenge? What did you say? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the challenge was, uh, so take what you've learned over the past half an hour and create a 20 second or less and I'm not a stickler about that, but 20 second or less video. So grab your cell phone or use your computer, whatever you want to do. Make a little video, 20 seconds or less, and then tweet it out. 
on Twitter, obviously, uh, tweet it out and use the hashtag AWS Educate. And we're going to put that in the chat window, the hashtag in the chat window. Yep. But uh, yeah, just create a little lesson. And uh, essentially what I tell my students is uh, teach it back to me and then give them an amount of time. So 20 seconds, in 20 seconds, teach it back to me. You know, what, what was I really trying to teach you? And then tweet it out. Hashtag awesome. AWS Educate. Well, great. Yeah, I think a lot of people had that quick question. We've got it in the chat window there. Can't wait to see those come in. Uh, I know some of the questions I, I jotted down a few as they're coming in. I think we answered some of them initially, but I think there's questions that a lot of people had. One of them was around, you know, we're creating uh, content that is meant for a very diverse audience. And one was around accessibility. And I don't know if you had some thoughts on one person was talking about, you know, that that uh, how do you, how can you make things captioned? Is that something to even think about when you're producing content? I don't know if you've addressed that at all with with some of the videos you've made or some of the other faculty you've worked with around sort of the accessibility uh, nature of, of uh, producing videos. Sure, absolutely. It's a great question. It's a very important question uh, and very important consideration. And I've got a lot of thoughts on this and this is something we deal with all the time and take into consideration all the time. Um, so the first, I, I have sort of my personal opinion about it and then there's uh, kind of what goes on at work and those, they're similar and we're sort of trying to figure out because we want, so the really the, what we're asking is um, we want to make sure that instructors can be innovative. We want to make sure that instructors can try new things and try them quickly uh, because one way for, if we're talking about video and I have a lot of personal experience with this and a lot of professional experience with this, one way to stop people from making videos is to say, sure, you can make a, a one minute video, but then you have to do all this stuff, all this stuff that you don't know how to do, all this stuff you got to figure out and it's all legal issues and make it sound scary. Now, we don't want that. Um, we don't want it to be scary. We don't want to stop people from innovating. I mean, that's not great. Uh, so one thing I tell people is, you know, first think about what the point of what you're creating is. For example, if you're creating, if you're trying something new, you know, if you want to try to do, you know, one minute um, overviews in your course, I want, to, I want to make these one minute videos every week, giving giving students a one minute overview well, of me walking outside with a cell phone. And I'm not comfortable with that, but I want to try it. You know, it's that's outside of my comfort zone. Let me give that a try. Um, first of all, where you put it, you know, uh, YouTube, for example, has made leaps and bounds with uh, providing transcripts and closed captioning, automatic transcripts and closed captioning. So if you upload into YouTube, for example, and a lot of other places like Facebook also does this, uh, um, and there are a lot of resources that, that can be shared in the chat uh, by people in my team who are in this, in this session right here. They can share some resources as well, some links to some resources. Um, but a lot of those resources, all of those tools will automatically create the closed captions and they will automatically create the transcripts. And that is what is required for a video. So a lot of this stuff, and, and those are, again, those are getting very, very accurate. And also it's not the most difficult thing to go in and edit them if they're not perfectly accurate. You can add some punctuation, you can change some of the words. Sometimes, you know, when I look at my automatically closed captions, so closed captioned things on YouTube, some of them are pretty funny actually, uh, but it's got much, much better, especially over the past year. So that's one thing to think about, but, but back to the intention of the media that you're creating. If you're trying something new, you know, if you're experimenting and, and you're going out on, you know, you're, you're experimenting with, you know, I've never created a video before. I've never created a video outside walking with my cell phone or whatnot. Um, what, I, what I try to encourage people to do is experiment. Yes, yes to everything. Um, accessibility is very important as long as your mindset, and, and I've, I've never run into a teacher that their, where their mindset is different. But as long as your mindset is, I'm going to do the best that I can to meet the needs of every student, period, 
everybody, every teacher I talk to agrees with this. Awesome. Yes, I'm going to do the best I can, right? With every lesson, with everything that I create. But one way to think about this in order to promote innovation is to say, you know, if I want to try something new, make it optional. Make it optional, right? So this is an optional, I'm going to do these one minute videos. I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to get some student feedback and see um, what they say, you know, um, see if it works. Do, do the students like it? But it's, 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 it's an optional it's an optional resource. It doesn't, you know, it's not a graded resource. It's not, it, not everybody has to watch it if they don't want to, but just to collect a little data. So it's doing an experiment. I'm gonna make these videos. Do students like it? Yeah, they seem to like it, great. So once I realize, okay, I've made 50 of these things. Students really like it, it's been optional, but now I'm, I wanna make it required because it's gonna benefit everybody. So now I say, okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it required. Um, and, and then I can look into uh, if, if there are students in my course that require that accommodation because I do want to meet the needs of every student, I can make those accommodations and I can start thinking about, OK, what are some of these automatic captioning? What are some of these automatic tools that I can use in order to make these uh, videos, for example, completely accessible? So that's that's kind of how I think about it. Um, but I just to restate. Um, there. It is a struggle because we we really do not we we definitely want to meet the needs of every student in every class always, uh, but we do not want to stifle innovation. It's a really good distinction. I like that. I like the the breakdown of of, of those things. I think that um, one of the things we've heard too is uh, people are at this point in time are having to. Uh, innovate at an incredibly fast pace, right? So you're having to switch so much stuff online. Uh, so I, I think one of the things that came in, another question that uh, I thought was interesting, I had not quite heard it put this way, but it was around uh, podcasting, kind of not necessarily, not necessarily versus video, but podcasting in a sense, is it a good thing uh, that students maybe can do, be doing something else while you know, just listening rather than having to watch a, a video. I didn't know if you you had thoughts on that. I know my own personal learning style. I, I particularly like podcasting and I can be not necessarily uh, multitasking or, you know, doing that thing, but I might be walking and I love to listen to podcasts on a, or in my car going um, at this point, probably just around my block because I can't really go anywhere. But uh, if I'm all out on a walk, uh, I do who enjoy learning from from those but i didn't know if you had had uh, some thoughts on on um on, on that piece or had faculty who had thoughts on that lodge sure absolutely i think i think that you know the answer to most questions along these lines is uh you want to do what's best for your students uh, so as you get to know your students more as you get to know your students uh strengths and 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 what how they learn maybe they learn best and how they process information best you want to kind of steer in those directions uh but you know podcasting versus video uh it really it just it depends uh what are you comfortable with you know if you if if your entry into the game uh, if you've never created media before let's say uh and and video seems like a high barrier of entry I think podcast is a nice solution. I, I agree with you, Mike, that um, I listen to podcasts while I'm walking all the time. Uh, however, we, we, we also need to think of what, <laughs> what we are trying to teach. I think that a podcast about, uh, if Megan McIntyre did a podcast about using Excel, I think that that wouldn't go very well. <laughs> I don't think that I'd be able to w be walking outside and, and Megan saying, okay, now in cell, you know, 73, we're going to copy. I'm sorry, Megan, if, if you're listening, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know enough about Excel to be funny about it, but um, yeah. So it really depends. It depends on what your students need, what your students, uh, the feedback you get from your students and what you're offering them. Um, and what you're teaching, of course, and and just in general, um, you know, one of the sort of a, a big picture best practice is in every lesson we want to have we, we want to try to offer students a variety 
of paths to get to the end, right? So maybe there's a short podcast and that meets the needs of some students who are outside walking and that works really well for them. Then in addition, there's maybe a short video that I found somewhere that I made and then there's a short, you know, some some reading and then, you know, then I obviously want to turn it around and get students to create and, and share their ideas in, in a variety of ways. So we want to, you know, we want to do a lot of task switching. So it's not one or the other. It's find a balance of, you know, what works for you and for your students. Awesome. I know we've already got some coming in via some entries via Twitter, so this is great. Keep them up. Uh, we're going to keep answering questions here. Those are just some that I pulled. And Lodge, I don't know if you had some that you saw that you wanted to address. I can keep, I have a few more on the board that I pulled out, but uh, if you have, if there's, there, is there one that you want to address that, that you saw come through? You know, the ones the one that I wrote down that I definitely wanted to address was uh, the accessibility um, so that I kind of had mentally prepared for that. But if there are if you have another one, I'd be happy to uh, dive into that. Not not to hit the ball back in your direction. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No. So another one just came around, uh, you know, the possibility of having like remote inter interviews or guest lectures. Uh, and I didn't know if, if if that's something you wanted to touch on a little bit. I think probably this format lends itself really well to that, but I, I, I it might even uh, be an opportunity for a lot of people to have those those guest lectures join or people just to pop in uh, with, with different points of view. So I didn't know if that was something you wanted to uh, ha have run with or, or done in a collaborative way uh, before. You know, I, I know of, uh, so Wake Tech is a, obviously a community college, and so we have a lot of. Uh, for example, we have we have a culinary um, school at the at, at the school. We have a culinary department, and you know, uh, so a lot of those, a lot of the um, the workforce preparedness courses bring in a lot of outside perspectives and a lot of um, a lot of those. Uh, sorry, there's a cat. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, so they look, bring in a lot of outside, a lot, a lot of outside participation from people in the community. So yeah, I think that uh, I think that is something that could be definitely integrated. I think that's something that could be fairly seamless, both synchronous and asynchronous. And I will try to make that distinction or, or keep thinking about this. That you know, as we move to you know more synchronous kind of classes and more people do that uh i think we need to be aware of kind of the 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 burden the heavy burden on on the things like you know these meeting software or these meeting tools and the internet in general so i i, I don't know it's just yes i think that is a great strategy i think that you know bringing in outside perspectives and and people in the community to speak to our students is always a great idea uh, as long as they're qualified and, and it's appropriate to do so, uh, but yeah, I think there's I think there's a lot of that going on at Wake Tech already, and I think there will be more in the future. Awesome, yeah, I think that that that's one that we've seen. Even even you don't have to even think about it from uh, you know somebody from far away. I have heard just from doing some of our office hours with educators coming in and sharing best practices of educators who. Uh, you know, they, they actually are in the same building, but just because of class size restraints of things that maybe they're teaching a very similar course, uh, they're now sort of tag teaming and saying, hey, I'm going to take, you know, these three or three, four things to do with all the students. And you're going to take these three or four topics to do with the students. And sometimes we're going to come together to do these uh, where where physical restraints within the class may have can find that or, or stop that before, now they can do this at a larger scale. So they're able to combine efforts to, to do this uh, kind of co-teaching and working together. So I don't think it even has to necessarily be somebody from uh, from the other side of the world over that, although that's, that's really cool, uh, but it can certainly be somebody that, that you can collaborate with. It may even be, you know, had, had formerly just been right down the hall. Right, that's a fantastic idea. I, I will add on to this, um, not, uh, uh, though I just will add on to this that it is it also gives us an opportunity uh, to ask you know if we're if we're asking someone to come in and talk to our students an opportunity for us to also ask them to maybe create uh, a short presentation ahead of time um, and then kind of offer that to our students let the students sit with that for 
however long, you know, uh, so they send a short, you know, 10 minute video overview of what they do and what they want to talk about. Give that to students ahead of time so the students can process and create questions and then maybe do a quick synchronous meeting with those with that individual in the community or the individual down the hall so that students have these kind of higher level questions and are ready to have a more in-depth conversation instead of just all at the same time, you know, a, a sort of a, a just a, a inline presentation and then and then questions at the end. Awesome. Well, definitely keep, uh, you know, everyone keep keep the, the, the questions coming in. Just look and see if some other ones I, I jotted down uh, from, from the board here just as they were coming in. One of them was around, you know, students as creators. Uh, are there any other any other methods, anything that you've seen that have been uh, good for, uh, I don't want to say like a template, but are things that you've, you've seen that have been used good for students to be able to produce work or just uh, produce content to get it back in the hands of teachers? Any, any, I guess guidelines, maybe that's the best thing. Like, if there are any particular guidelines or, that you would put in place for students to teach back or to respond back via video. Right. Yeah. It's kind of that back to that, uh, you know, whatever works for your students, whatever they're comfortable and confident with, whatever you are comfortable and confident with supporting. Uh, so it really depends from person to person. Uh, as as you're asking that question, what popped into my mind was so, so I mean my, my generic answer is what whatever we can get whatever tool we can have students use whatever we can use to challenge students to create and, and share their perspectives and share high quality content use it try it you know experiment with it for sure um, one of the reasons why I really one yeah one of the reasons I really like video and even simple very simple video. I mean, I um, one of the things that I talk about all the time, one of the things I promote, I've got hundreds of videos on YouTube talking about this kind of thing, but you know, students, uh, and teachers too, but students just using their cell phone, putting up a little whiteboard next to them and teaching a, a whiteboard lesson like that. Um, I like that because it takes away a lot of the, uh, we can, we teachers and students alike can get distracted and overwhelmed by choices. You know, you got PowerPoint in front of you, you got all these tools and, and pretty soon it's, you know, seven hours later, you're just trying to make a one minute video. But if you just have a little whiteboard and you have your cell phone, it just gets down right down to the point, right down to the issue. And it helps students, I think, you know, the, in this, whatever, so whatever is simple, I guess is what I'm getting at. It helps students stay focused on what matters, which is, sharing their authentic perspective and sharing their authentic lesson with the group of, with their audience, whatever that audience is, probably the rest of the class. So just keep it simple and experiment, see what works with students and see what works for you. And we had another one just somewhat in that same vein around students, uh, you know, posting videos and then, you know, if they put what kind of permissions do you need or what kind of things you maybe need to think through if you're going to put it into your learning management system and have for, for future class use? I, I know just from working with a lot of different, you know, higher ed institutions and even, uh, you know, K-12 institutions uh, probably depends on some of the rules of where you're at from your institution, but also from your, your country. But I don't know if you if, if you've seen some best practices around that or what. What kind of permissions do you need to get for for utilizing that for future students to see their work? Yeah, I mean, I would 100% say check with your institution and see what their policy is. It'll be vastly different for you know a, a pre-K through 12 school than it is at Wake Tech, and it might even be different at Wake Tech than it is for you know at NC State. Uh, but definitely check with your whatever you know IT department or whatever department you have at your institution that would have that answer. Uh, there's not one answer um, for that. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think even, I think about even for us, we work with so many students. So we, for, for AWS Educate, that program itself, we work with hundreds of thousands of students and uh, you know we kind of have to work with them in their own rules at their own institutions and even from them of how do we use their work. Uh, so yeah, that definitely, definitely makes sense. 
Nice. I'm gonna back, uh, let me back up yeah. just for a second. Yeah. And we were talking a second ago. This is something I'd written down because I saw somebody ask something earlier and forgot. Um, but, you know, when talking about, you know, active learning and, and students teaching back, um, one of the things that my one of my colleagues, uh, Lauren Caruso, who is actually in, in the meeting here, she's been doing quite a bit of work uh, on OER courses, you know, open education resource courses. So mm -hmm. making the textbook an open resource. Uh, so students would interact with a, a digital textbook that the teacher helped kind of uh, craft. And so she's been doing a lot of work with this. And, and one of the conversations I've had with her and what we're going to, you know, start in, in looking into the future of, you know, how, how students teaching back is, you know, students making videos. It's quick. It tends to be easy. Students really like it. But what if we took that sort of to the extreme that um, a lot of instructors at Wake Tech uh, and around the country are, are trying to do these OER courses um, to make you know digital textbooks. And Lauren and I have been discussing recently. Well, what if we take that same concept and and part of you know some of our online courses, part of the courses, challenge the students to create sort of a student like a student created OER. So you know, students work in groups. And each group is assigned a part of the text, you know, text in quotes, uh, you know, a part of the, the content of the course. And their job is to create sort of these authentic custom uh, lessons that that when the semester is over, these these student created digital texts are not just a resource for the future, but they are a very, very powerful learning experience. For the students in the present, that makes sense. Just looking through, a few more questions are coming in. So one's just around PowerPoint, and I think around you know, do you advise you know, using those slot like PowerPoint slides in class? Um, you know, is it something that, that uh, you know, a lot of times you talk to the PowerPoint, are there some strategies around around that? I know I saw, you know, kind of even just watching, you know, you today in the presentation, you had PowerPoint slides, but used them in a kind of a different way of just added instruction, uh, you know, more details or making a highlighting a specific point rather than kind of making them, you know, that that what nobody particularly likes is somebody just just reading a slide. So <laughs> no, I, I didn't know if you had, so, you know, is it something you want you sparsely intermittent or just, just based on what you're trying to convey to the students, maybe maybe the, the, the topic that you're teaching? Sure, yeah, it's it's back in that realm a little bit that it, dep it really depends what you're teaching. Now, um, the, the rule of thumb, of course, and people have been saying this, I'm not the first person to say this, but you know, uh, yeah, we don't want to put a pair. Uh, uh, I don't. I shouldn't say that. Uh, it's it's a general consensus of you know moving away from having this the slide cr you know slammed with text, just a bunch of text on there, and you're sort of reading it more to a discussion, a discussion or more relaxed presentation where you have maybe a couple of bullet points. So some people find that useful and valuable. Uh, what I what I will say about this is that. Is that what what I do know for sure? Kind of the first step, or one one of the first ideas, maybe here is is that whatever PowerPoint you have, whatever you currently use, um, if you create a video, whether you have the your you know you have your face in it or not, or you know the voiceover PowerPoint, that is going to be just the video of that presentation of the same PowerPoint you've been using will be significantly shorter. Than when you present it live, for a lot of different reasons, not to, not the least of which is when you're live, it's just a, a, an endless series of cognitive interruptions in a classroom. So if you just get rid of all those interruptions and you record your powerpoints um, uh, by your, when you're by yourself, when you're in a quiet, relaxed place, they're gonna simply those videos will be much much shorter than your than your live presentations. Now, what I would suggest is. Uh, give a few of those a try, 
Uh, and then also as, as you reflect, as you watch your videos back, put yourself in the position of a student and say, okay, what, what would my student, and if, if, if my slides are, you know, if, if it's a paragraph and I'm reading the paragraph, maybe I might reflect on that and say, hmm, I, I could probably just do a couple bullet points. And it's because I think one of the reasons people, I mean, it makes logical sense. I'm gonna put a paragraph on the screen and read that because it makes sure I, it, it ensures that I don't forget anything. And then it, it ensures all the words get seen by all my students. But if I'm making a video of my PowerPoint, those issues, so, so a video is gonna have your transcript, it's gonna have your closed captioning, so all the words are still there, so it automatically created. So I can go to very sparse PowerPoints. I can have three bullet points instead of a paragraph because I don't need to, I don't need to put all the words on the screen. I don't have to have all that up there. Mm -hmm. Very true. I think one of the things that I've seen too is, uh, if if you know if there is very detailed information and i've seen people try to do this on powerpoints and i've seen it in presentations where they're they're talking a lot of of uh uh maybe financial numbers or things like that and uh uh i think i think like you're talking about like if you have it in a transcript or have it in a handout if it's something highly detailed where you do need to convey a lot maybe it's something they read ahead of time right it's a different assignment um and i think that you know instead of trying to cram it onto a, to a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> it's always good. I'm always thankful when somebody says like, no, here it is in the appendix. You can read this, you know, uh, ahead of time before we come together. And then if you have questions, we can go to whatever points you have on this 60 page paper. Oh yes, I'm, I'm a big fan of, <laughs> you know, uh, less is more for sure, yeah. And I know we had, I know we're getting a little bit close to, to the time here. I, I do wanna, some of the questions came in is are, are there places where, uh, you know, a forum or additional questions or things are gathered. I, I know there's probably tons of, of forums that are taking place out there. From from a sheer uh, you know aspect of being able to ask questions of peers of those who are educators who uh, have kind of raised their hand from around the world and said, "I have experience in going online. I have experience in doing things like producing." uh videos for my students in, in in a in a flipped kind of classroom model on that level we do have office hours that are available for you we're going to be doing those for the next uh couple of weeks here actually all the way through may 8th uh, we'll have office hours i'm going to put that just link uh, it has both our webinars and office hours into the chat window those are available uh we had a great discussion actually today uh, and even yesterday around just some of the things, I think some of the questions have come in around video, what kind of video, uh, you know, cameras do you use? What type of audio do you use? And we had great discussions around everything from, like you were talking about Lodge, just ultra simple. You can use your cell phone. You know, you don't have to go and spend hundreds or thousands of dollars. It can be, use what you have right now uh, to where people say like, no, I really want to go, you know, more advanced till we started having discussions all right well here's a step up here's what i use to do you know uh, to to do voiceovers or to record things and it you know it was a great discussion those office hours are available like i said they're available monday wednesday and friday uh they are at 3 p.m eastern time uh and then we also have them after our webinars typically so you'll see those that are happening over the next couple of weeks i encourage you to go in and listen in there um those are, are certainly some opportunities to answer questions more thank you so much uh you know lodge for for the presentation today uh we've seen a lot of the uh things come in via twitter keep those coming in and lodge if you want to pick some winners and send over i know you haven't had a chance to watch them because you've been answering questions like crazy we'll give you some time and then we can make that announcement uh, uh by tomorrow of who who's going to get the, the the devices for the alexa devices but we saw i've already seen several of those come in uh but we'll give you just a little bit of time we know you've been answering questions again we've captured these questions we thank you very much for your time lodge anything you want to address or anything else we can stay on for a while if there's something you really want to to, to address or comment on or answer another question question uh but wanted to to express our, our deep gratitude and thank you for for presenting today 
I just wanted to echo that and thank you for including me and thanks for putting together all this, all these webinars and all the office hours and your dedication to helping the wide range of instructors make this amazing transition uh, to sort of the next generation or the next paradigm really of education. So I, I appreciate all the work that you're putting into it and all the work that you're group is putting into it. So thank you for having me and thank you everyone for participating. Yes, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, we'll be looking at those uh, the tweets that are coming in, picking a winner and get you to the devices out to you. Thank you so much again for joining us today. Uh, this is being recorded. So I know we've said that a few times. Just want to reiterate that it is being recorded. Some said you wanted some colleagues to join and they weren't able to. We will get it up on the website as soon as possible. In addition to that, it will be available uh, via our YouTube channel. Uh, as well. That will take just a little bit longer because we do, again, some of that translation, uh, transcribing and translation pieces and get it up on there. Uh, but they'll be available for anyone, anytime uh, on both of those locations. So look for those up soon. Uh, and everyone have a great evening, great morning, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. And we hope to see you in our office hours or on a webinar again soon. Thank you.